So obviously uh, now we're gonna start in a new unit. And this unit is gonna be slightly different than the previous few units. Um, this unit is on fair division and voting. Basically, it's how do we allot and divide up things, right? So when people have uh, shared power or you know shared stakes in things, how do we divide those things up? And that's all about fair division, and then voting ties into that. And in the sense of how do how do individuals vote and things like that. So, anyways, it's going to look a lot different because there's not going to be a lot of formulas. It's going to be a lot of more processes. All right. So the process um, is the thing that we'll learn on a lot of these things once we get to apportionment and those types of things, then you'll see. But that's what chapter five is all about, dividing things fairly, all right? So let's start on that. Let's start talking about fair division. So, the overall setup to every fair division problem is that we have something that people want to divide up between themselves. We're going to call the things that they divide up the goods, right? One way to think of fair division is think of I don't know, a group of pirates who stumble upon a treasure chest and they open this treasure chest and there's lots of different treasures in it. There's, you know, gold coins, there might be a gold crown, there might be rubies and gemstones, there might be, you know, pearls and necklaces and those types of things. So there's a lot of different types of treasure all within this one chest. And those pirates have to divide up the treasure, the goods, between them. All right. Now, each of the individuals or each of the parties is going to have an interest in dividing up the goods, meaning that each of them is going to get a certain slice. Let's just, for the sake of argument right now, assume that everybody has the same interest. Okay. That if everybody had the same understanding of what each item is worth, then it's easy to divide things up because we could all divide it up fairly and we'd all agree perfectly. But in reality, what actually happens is that people view things differently. Imagine being in that Imagine being one of the pirates who stumbles along this treasure chest. Well, one pirate may say the gemstones and put a lot higher value on the gemstones than on the gold coins. And other, another pirate may put a lot more value on the gold coins than the gemstones. Maybe some pirate says, well, I'd rather have the gold coins than this crown because if I have the gold coins, they're going to be a lot easier to use. Whereas some other person says, well, yeah, those might be easier to use, but the crown is actually worth more, right? So every party is going to have slightly different views on what they think 
the goods are. And so we're in that scenario where everybody sees individual items within the treasure chest differently. And we have to figure out a way to divide it up. Does everybody get that? That's kind of the premise. Now, the basic assumptions that we're going to make are the following. We're going to assume that everybody wants to maximize their share of the goods. We're also going to assume that whatever rules we decide are going to be obeyed. We're also going to assume that if I'm one of the pirates, I don't see, I don't necessarily know what the other pirates are thinking at this time. So I don't know what you value. So I can't predict what the other pirates are thinking. And then we're going to assume, like I said, all the parties have an equal right to the goods. So if there's four or five, let's say five pirates, then we're going to split up the treasure five different ways. That makes sense. Now, here's the interesting aspect. Since each party has different values, a fair share is going to mean different things to different people. So if we assume, like we did in our last, that all parties have equal rights to the goods, if you have N parties, like if you have five parties, five individual pirates in this case, the fair share means that each party gets one nth, or in our case, one fifth of the goods in their own opinion. Does that make sense? So in their own opinion. So if we split up the piles into five different piles, I might see one of those piles as actually being a fair share. And if you're one of the other pirates, you might not think that pile is a fair share because we have different values. We value the different goods differently. Does that make sense? So fair share means I get my portion, one end of the goods, as I see it. And because we have different opinions, oftentimes people will walk away with more than their fair share at the end of this. All right. Now, let's talk about a common procedure that people utilize when they divide things up. One common procedure that people utilize is what's called the taking turns procedure. They divide up into a lot of you know, different smaller piles. And then just, I take a piece out of this pile. I, I, they, they divide up all the goods and you just take turns picking pieces that you like. All right. So there's five pirates there. They display all of the goods on the ground, on the sand on the beach. And I being the first pirate can pick the first item. You being the second pirate get to pick the second item, and then the third pirate picks the third item, so on and so forth. Does that make sense? 
if you think about that, it sounds fair. Taking turns sounds fair, but doesn't always lead to a great outcome. Let me show you how this would work. So let's just do a example with two individuals and we have six different items, six different piles of goods so that I can so that I can uh, write it here. I'm going to copy this. Let's see if I can put this on a Word document so I can write in there. All right. That's silly. All right. Wait, see that? A little bit too big, so let me also do this. All right. Now it's all on one, okay? So let's pretend person A picks first, okay? So if we're doing taking turns and person A picks first, well, A is going to pick what A thinks is the most valuable. So if you can see the highest percentage that A thinks, pile four. So A is going to pick that first. Now, once A picks that, that's no longer available. So B is going to pick the highest percentage that they think out of the remaining pile. There you go. Remaining piles, excuse me. So there you go. Out of the remaining piles, the highest percentage for B is pile two. So B is going to pick Pile two. Everybody get that? Now, pile four and pile two are off the table. A picks the next highest in their opinion. In this case, that would be pile three. That's 18. So A picks the highest in their opinion. Now pile three is off the table. Then B gets a turn. Well, the highest for B is pile five that remains. And then now it's A's turn. A is going to pick up pile one because that's the highest percentage that A sees. Now pile one's off the table. And then pile six, obviously that's the last one, so that by default goes to B. Everybody get that? Now I gotta sit down for this. I want you to notice at the end of this, after all the piles are picked, what A walks away thinking that they've gotten. So A got pile one, which is 14%, pile three, which is 18%, and pile four, which is 24%. So if you add up 
14 plus 18 plus 24, A has 56% of the goods in A's opinion. Can you get that? B has, well, what did B have? B put pile two, so that's 30%. Pile five, that's 14%. And pile six, which is 12%. So B also has 56% of the goods. That makes sense? So they both all walk away with more than their fair share because their fair share, share is one half, right? And one half as a decimal is 0.5 or 50%. So because there's two people, each individual should walk away with 50% of the goods. You hope, anyways. And this time, taking turns led to that. So taking turns was just fine. Now, what would happen if B would start... with the picking. So when A started with the picking, we were all right. Well, if B starts with the picking, B is gonna pick the highest percentage that's available. So B is gonna pick pile two. Now pile two is out. Everybody see where I'm getting at? A is gonna pick the highest percentage available. So A is gonna pick pile four. Now pile four is out. Next, B picks the highest percentage available. That's pile five. Then A picks the highest percentage available. For A, that's pile three. Now B picks the highest percentage. Now there's a tie here, so they just flip it, I guess. Flip, flip a coin or something like that. Or if there is a tie on the last two, maybe B is generous and says, hey, you pick whatever you want. But um, let's say B picks pile six again, and A picks pile one as the default. Okay, follow that? Notice in this case, we ended up with the exact same things, right? Whether A picked first or B picked first, A had the exact same piles and B had the exact same piles. Does that make sense? That does not happen in general. In general, that doesn't happen. All right, so we had A pick first, we had B pick first. Both of these led to fair shares. But let's look at this one. Oh. By the way, this... Doesn't 
see if I can get this. Let's delete this whole thing. I ain't good. There we go. All right. So I'm just trying to size this up so I don't have to uh, rewrite stuff. And so that everybody can see the whole table. These tables are in your notes, are in the guided notes. So um, if you think, man, I can't write those tables very that fast, you can always just uh, print out the notes. So let's do taking turns with this one where A picks first, okay? And in this one, I've arranged them so that it's kind of in order, right? The most versus least likely. So if A picks first, they're gonna pick pile one. Then pile one gets off the table. Now it's B's turn. Well, B sees pile two as the next most valuable. So B is gonna pick pile two. The next most valuable to A is pile three. There you go. Now that's off the table. The next most valuable to B, well, these are all tied, but let's just pick pile four be there. So B flips. Next most valuable to A is pile five. And then B gets the last remaining pile, which is pile six. Does that make sense? Now this was taking turns again. But now I want you to see what percentage A thinks they have. A thinks that they have 30 plus 20 plus 10. So A believes that they have 60% of the goods. And B believes that they have 22 plus 8 plus another 8. That's only 38% of the goods. Now a fair share to B is 50%. So in this case, with the taking turns procedure, it did not lead to both individuals getting a fair share. Does that make sense? So taking turns seems nice and works to give people a fair share a lot of the times, but its big downfall is that it doesn't guarantee each party gets a fair share. All right. This happens a lot when you open up and you're splitting things up and there's one item that's really, really huge compared to everything else. If we open up our treasure chest, maybe that crown in the treasure chest is way, way bigger than everything else and worth way, way more than everything else. And whoever gets that crown is gonna get way more than their fair share and everybody else gets less than their fair share. So taking turns may seem like a good idea 
but it doesn't guarantee fair share. All right. So what we're going to do, <coughs> excuse me, is we're going to create some methods that do guarantee fair shares, right? The first methods that guarantee fair shares are what we call divider chooser methods. All right. So we want methods that ensure fairness because the taking turns method did not ensure fairness. Does it ensure I get a fair share? Let's start out with the divider and chooser method where we only have two people. If you only have two people, the divider-chooser method is fairly simple. One person divides up the goods, they are the divider, and the other person chooses which lot they get. They are the chooser. Now, if you're the person who divides up the goods, you are going to see into two piles, you as long as you're playing it fair, like we assumed, you're going to split into two piles. And the divider is going to see those two piles as being 50% of the goods. Right? All right. The chooser might look at those two piles and say, well, I see this pile as being 45% of the goods, and this pile as being 55% of the goods. So what the chooser is going to do is the chooser is going to say, that they want to pick pile two. and get 55% of the goods, right? They pick the more valuable one. And the divider gets what's left over. And that's okay because that's still a fair share in their opinion, right? As long as the divider didn't try to cheat and actually split the pile, the goods into 50-50 piles, this is gonna work. Both individuals are gonna walk away at the fair share. Everybody follow that? That method, by the way, was on a was on a Jiffy peanut butter commercial a long time ago, where the mom, the two kids were fighting over 
the Jif peanut butter sandwich. And then she said, well, kid A, you divide, you cut the sandwich, and then kid B had to choose, or something like that. I can't remember. But that's what happens. Okay. So if you did a divider chooser method here, what would happen is that if A divides, they want to split things up into 50 50. Probably the easiest way to do that is just to take pile one and pile three together as a pile and like combine them. You know what I'm saying? And then two, four, five, and six, those add up to 50% too. And then what person B would do is they'd say, well, pile one and pile three, that makes up 54%. Two, four, five, and six make up 46%. Everybody get what I'm doing there? And therefore B would have picked the one with pile three and one, and A would have gotten two, four, five, and six. So you can see that while taking turns didn't work in this scenario, the divider chooser method does. Okay. So the big advantage of this divider chooser method with two people is that it makes sure everybody gets a fair share. Everyone walks away with a fair share. However, there is a disadvantage to this. And the disadvantage comes from the fact that the divider always has to split into 50-50 piles. So the divider is always walking away with 50%, whereas the chooser oftentimes walks away with above 50%. So it's always better in the divider chooser method with two people to be the chooser. Does that make sense? So the chooser is in the better overall position. So while it does guarantee fairness, or it does guarantee a fair share, it's always better to be the chooser in these divider chooser methods. <clears throat> so divider chooser methods, all right. It's got, it's better to be the chooser, obviously, but other than that, it does guarantee a fair share. You might say, well, what's gonna happen when you have more than two people? If we have more than two people, you can still use versions of these divider chooser methods. Okay. There are a couple of different ways to do this. So we'll look at three different systems that are kind of offshoots of divider chooser methods. All right. When you put these systems to two people, they're all divider chooser method two people. But when you try to expand it out, you know, there's a couple of different ways to expand it out. So I'll show you those systems. We'll show you three of them. 
One is called the loan divisor method. All right. This sounds just like it, what it says. One person is going to divide into a bunch of piles. So if there are five pirates that walk up to the treasure chest, one pirate divides into five different piles. Okay. And then all the other pirates, the other four, anonymously say, I'm okay with pile one, two, and three. And another pilot may say, I'm okay with pile two, four, and five. And another pilot may say, well, I'm okay with three, one, and that's it. And they're going to do this anonymously so that they can't hear each other. All right? If there is an option to give away where we can work it out that every pirate walks away satisfied with one of the piles, then we're done. We just give those away. If ever two pirates disagree, what they'll do is one of the unwanted piles they'll give to the divider, and the divider can walk away, and now you're playing the game with less individuals. So you start over with less individuals. Does that make sense? So let's say I'm the initial divider pirate, and I divide into five piles, and all four other pirates say, I only want pile number one. That's the only one that's worth anything. So what I would do is I would, as the divider, say, well, I'll take pile number five and walk away, and you four work it out on the remaining goods. And then those other four can then pick a new divisor, and then they can do the same process again with four people. All right? So if you can ever have a tie with less people, you can do that. All right, so let's take a look at this idea. Let's play, let's assume that there were three pirates or three individuals and A is the individual who has divided already, right? So what's happened is that the divider, who is person A, is going to split things up into three piles. And because this was the divider, they should have one third of the goods, right? One third here is a fair share. And percentage-wise, one-third is about 33.3%. Rounded. Everybody okay with that? So that's what's happened. So A has split the three piles, and they're all 33 and a third, the 33.3% in person A is you. Now B looks at those three piles and says, I think pile number one is worth 40%. I think pile number two is worth 25%. And I think Pile number three is worth 35%. Okay, with that. Person C sees those three piles and gives pile number one 
Pile number two, 45. Pile number three, 25. So what we do is we look at B and C. Notice that the only one that C thinks is a fair share is pile two. And I don't know how you want to see this. Sometimes people put them in the boxes. Sometimes people use the grid. I'll use both. Notice that B thinks pile one and pile three is also pile one and three are fair shares. But not pile two. So C is okay with that. B is okay with those two, right? Because A was the divider, A is okay with all three of them. Okay. They follow that by default. A is okay with all three of them. So what I would do is I would say give C Pile two, because that's the only one C is satisfied with. I would give pile one to B, and then the remaining pile would go to A. Does that make sense? You can do that via the grid as well. Some people would. Do this. Every second time. Sorry. So some people will go, okay. Get yeah, C that one, and then B gets that one, and then the only pile we haven't used is A, so they throw an A. Oh, I'm sorry, I muted that. I apologize. So they just write in, you know, the letters. So C is satisfied with that one. We could have lined out those two. Those are not fair shares. You could eliminate that one because it's not a fair share. So is there a way to divvy these up? And yes. You have C pile two, B pile one, and then the remaining pile goes to A. That work? Kind of how it goes. By the way, would it have been okay if I would have given pile three to B and pile one to A? Sure. Sure. It would have given me fair share for every individual, right? As long as we get above 33.3% for each individual, we're good to go. So doing this also would have worked. 
which tells you with the, the, with the loan divisor method, a lot of times there's multiple ways in which we can get this to work, right? Sometimes there's a lot of different ways in which this could work. I want you to check out this one. A has divided into three piles and decide who gets what. So A is the divider, still got a third. So 33.3% is the percentage that ensures a fair share. All right. So hopefully you noticed that the only pile that B was happy with is pile one. All right. A was happy with all three because they didn't die. C was happy with pile one and pile two. Now in this scenario, There's only one way that this can work. There's only, since B was only happy with pile one, you have to give pile one to B. Once B has pile one, the only way C is now going to be happy is to get pile two. And then A gets whatever is remaining. Does that work? So that's basically how that all worked out. Any questions about that? That's pretty straightforward. Again, I'm drawing these pictures. You don't have to draw these pictures. I'm just trying to make it easier to see. A lot of times people will just look at this grid and you know, put letters and then say, well, which ones go where? You know, just like I did previously. Or which ones are we not satisfied with? If there is an option, we give it. If there's not, then we have to do something else. So here's an example of one 
that doesn't lead to an option where everybody's happy. So A has divided, B and C say, well, I'm satisfied with pile one, but not with pile two or three. In this case, what would happen is we give one of these piles to pile A, to person A. Let's do pile three just for the sake of argument. So we're going to give pile three to person A. Okay, A gets pile three. And then what are B and C going to do? Well, they're going to recombine those two piles that remain. That's why I want to give pile three so I can circle that. And person B Person B and person C um, redo the divider chooser method with the goods. from piles one and two. Okay. So they're gonna basically just put everything back. It's like we had three pirates, one pirate walked away, all the other stuff went back into the treasure chest, and now the two remaining people have to do the, the operation again. Does that make sense? So that's how that works. Okay. So that's the loan divisor method. Loan divisor is that one person divides and everybody else anonymously chooses the piles that they are, that give them a fair share. All right. There's also something called the loan chooser method. And the loan chooser method, <coughs> excuse me, is this. Everybody does a divider chooser method, except for one person. Then we add one more person that we need to split the goods with. So these pirates walk up, four of them divvy out the treasure, and then they for had forgotten about a fifth person. And the fifth person walks up and says, well, what about my treasure? Or maybe it was the captain who was on the ship and four pirates, you know, split the treasure up and the captain says, well, I mean, I stayed with the ship and I need to get my fair share too. So what's going to happen is all but one person 
has already done and get their fair share. All right. Then each of those individuals split up their own loot into sub piles, specifically N sub piles, if there's N people. And then that last person gets to pick a slice from each of the other individuals. Does that make sense? All right. So A and B, let's say we have three people in this, and I'm just gonna do this with pictures right now instead of with numbers. A and B walk onto the treasure and they do a divider chooser method between themselves. They start out and they split their piles up as they see fairly. And we need to split. So A then is going to split their pile into three sections. B is going to split their pile into three sections. And this lone chooser gets to, to pick one of these sections from A and also one of the sections from B. Now, if you think about that, If C chooses, let's say, this section and this section, right? They're going to pick the two best sections that they think, right? So they're going to definitely have their fair share. Because A and B split this up to begin with, and because they split their sections up, they're going to get two-thirds of the half. Does that make sense? So imagine A imagines they split theirs in the half and B has a half and then they get two thirds of that. So A thinks they walk away with one third of the goods, which is what their fair share is. And B is going to walk away with at least one third of the goods because that's what B thinks their fair share is. So every individual walks away with at least one third of the goods. And that's kind of easy to see because if you look at how many sections each person gets, they get two out of the six total sections. And two out of the six total sections is the same thing as one third of it, right? And because they pick them, because A picked their three sections and B picked their three sections, it's guaranteed to be at least one third of the goods. They follow that logic. Because they got to choose, each individual is guaranteed to get one third of the goods here. Each individual gets two out of the six total sections. Does that make sense? All right. So that's the lone chooser method. Okay. That's another divider chooser method. 
Now the last divider chooser type method with more people is called what's called the last diminisher method. Crap. Let me let me say something before I move on about this. I hope that it's obvious to you that it's better to be the chooser here, right? It's better to be the, the chooser here. And in the last example, it's better to be one of the many choosers than the one divider. Okay. So in the lone divisor method and in the lone chooser method. The best place to be is the chooser. That positional advantage. All right, so I forgot I forgot to say that before I went to last diminisher. <clears throat> so last diminisher is a version of divider chooser. Okay. But it's a sequence, sequential process, instead of a everybody choose, everybody divides, stuff like that. So here's what happens. Our pirates stand in a line. The first person in that line goes to the treasure chest and picks out what they think is a fair share. So I go to the treasure chest and I put in random stuff that I think is a fair share. If we have five pirates, that means I get one fifth of the goods. So I got in a bag what I think is one fifth of the goods. Now I go to the pirate standing next to me and I give them the bag, and they say one of two things. They say, I think that's less than a fifth of the goods, so you keep it. That's what's called passing on the pile. If they pass on the pile, then the next pirate is gonna have the same choice. I bring the bag to the next pirate, and the next pirate says, well, no, I think that's less than one fifth pass. If all four pirates pass, then I walk away with that bag of goods, and the process starts over with just the four remaining pirates. Does that make sense? Now, at any point in time in this sequence, when I give them the bag of the goods and they look through it, they can say, I think this is more than a fifth of the goods. So I'm going to take out a couple of gold coins, throw them back into the treasure chest, and I'm gonna claim the bag as my own with a couple of gold coins taken out. And I think this new bag that I've created is actually one fifth of the goods. And then they get control of the bag from that point forward. Does that make sense? So, they can either pass, which means allow me to keep the bag, or they can take a few things out of it and claim it for themselves. And you go down the line and each party gets to do that. All right. And once you've gone through that line of all the pirates, <clears throat> the pirate at the end who holds the bag gets to keep the bag. And there'll be four pirates remaining. 
and then the process starts over. Pirate number one goes, they collect another bag, which they think is one fifth of the total from the, you know, the start of the total. Does that make sense? And so this is the last diminisher method. Again, this is where I, as let's say the starting pirate, I am the person who is dividing, but I'm only creating one pile for myself. All right. And you can see that if I start with one fifth of the goods, if everybody passes to me, then I end up with exactly one fifth of the goods. But if somebody claims the bag and takes a few things out, I'm fine because there's more than four fifths of the goods still remaining in the treasure chest. Does that make sense? So, this does lead to everybody getting a fair share, in other words. So let's say we have three participants, A, B, and C. All right. A picks a pile. By the way, since we have three participants, we're using that 33.3 percentage again as our fair share. One third is 33.3 percent. So A picks a bag of goods. That's the first person to pick. And then turns to B and says, what do you want to do, person B? If B sees that pile as worth 30% of the goods, what's B going to do? Well, since it's under the 33 and a third percent, <clears throat> Since B sees it as 30%, D is going to pass. In other words, it's going to let A keep that pile. C sees the bag as worth 38%. So what C is going to do is C is going to throw something out of the bag. And claim it as their own. Now, because C is smart, they're probably going to throw out something really, really small, right? And they're going to walk away with about 38% of the total as they see it. Does that make sense? So that's the last diminisher method in a, in a real quick way. A has a pile. A sees it as 33.3%. B sees it as 30%. So B says, you keep that. C sees it as 38%. So C is going to take something out, maybe something really, really small, throw it, throw it back into the, you know, the treasure chest, and then walk away with almost 38% of the pile. 
claim it as their own. Does that make sense? Good. Okay. Now, to each of these, and maybe I should have said this just a second ago, but in that last diminisher method, it does guarantee a fair share. In fact, in the last diminisher method, it's possible that everybody walks away with more than their fair share. Right? That they see what they walk away with is more than one third. So in the loan divisor method, in the loan chooser method, and in the last diminisher method, all parties end up with a fair share. However, in each of those methods, the chooser is in the best position with the loan divisor and the loan chooser method. In the last diminisher method, it turns out the last party is in the best position. All right. The people that the individual has to pick first and the middle people are in the worst position. And the last position is always the best. So being the last person to choose, or in other words, being the last person to get to pass or claim the bag, that's the best place to be, right? So in all of these divider chooser methods, there is a positional advantage. It's better to be the chooser or in the last diminisher method, it's better to be the last person in line who gets to choose. All right. <clears throat> so while the benefits of all these divider chooser methods is that they guarantee a fair share, the drawback is that sometimes position matters. And so people can argue about position, and that's never a good thing to have. Now, the other thing that uh, can happen is sometimes it's really hard to divide up into piles. All right? If we stumble upon a treasure chest and there's five of us, and there's two crowns, and then three little mini gold coins, well, everybody's going to want the punk crowns. And so you either end up having to cut the crowns or in order to divide the piles or sell the crown and, you know, divide the money or something like that. But, um, oh, not yet. Oh, no, I think you're, are you in the next class? 1130. Yeah. 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 So, so sometimes it's really hard to divide into piles. And we'll see examples of that in the next section, right? And that's where kind of the next section comes into play. We'll talk about some bidding methods that you can do that uh, don't give anybody a positional advantage and don't... Uh, don't make it impossible to divide into piles. Does that make sense? So that's what we'll do next time. We'll work on bidding methods next time. Any question about divider chooser? Pretty straightforward. Good. All right. Well, then I will see you on Thursday. <laughs>